Hi, everybody. You're watching The Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Joined today by award-winning filmmaker Liz Garbus. How are you? Good. Thanks for having Good me. Good to meet you. Okay, so who killed Garrett Phillips? I've seen the first half hour, and <laughs> there's a lot going on in that first half hour, and that's only part of the story. So first that's of right. all, congrats on putting this together. Thank you. How did this all come about for you initially? Um, well, I read a story about it in the New York Times, and that's how I found the case. Um, I guess what's more interesting to viewers is how, you know, how did the story all get started? And it started in 2011 mm -hmm. when um, a 12-year-old Garrett Phillips uh, went home from school on his ripstick and um, a few hours later was pronounced dead. Um, and there's a mystery that has captivated the entire town. Um, of course, devastated his family since then. Um, and there was one person targeted for this crime, um, and we still don't know who killed Garrett Phillips or if there will be any justice in this case. So it's one thing to read a New York Times story. It's another thing to make a docu-series sure. like this. So what have been the challenges in terms of putting this thing together? Um, well, you know, it was really about kind of gaining the trust of the people who were so devastated and so involved in this case. So that's everything from um, family members of Garrett to um, the town officials who um, were under enormous pressure, pressure to solve this case and also um, knew the family, so they were personally affected. It's a small town. Yeah. The mom had um, a lot of relationships and contacts within law enforcement there, so it was a, it was a very charged case, as it should be. Um, from the, the moment that it occurred. But then there was another person who's Nick Hillary, who mm. from you know 12, within 12 hours of Garrett losing his life was targeted pretty much on his own, I mean, a, you know, as the only suspect um, for this crime. And so for his family, there was a um, enormous impact as well. So it was really about getting to talk to all those folks right. to answer your question and um, in you know, kind of the hardest period of their lives. So how would you describe Potsdam to somebody who hasn't been there? Because it's a small town, but it seems like a little bit of a different type of small town. It's a really interesting place. I mean, first of all, it's incredibly hard to get to, mm. <laughs> which I that, yeah. think I think some people who live there, they like that about sure. it. Um, as a filmmaker like you, coming so in good. and out, it was yeah. a little difficult, I think. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's in St. Lawrence County. Mm. It's um, you know an hour south from the Canadian border as you're driving. So you either would fly to Canada and drive south or fly to Syracuse and then have quite a long drive north. Um, and and St. Lawrence County is a rural agricultural community. There's also um, a lot of prisons there. Um, it's a mostly white community. Mm -hmm. um, and But there's also um, universities there. There are great um, universities in that area. So there's SUNY Potsdam, there's Clarkson University, there's St. Lawrence um, University where uh, Nick mm. Phil, uh, Nick Hillary w uh, w uh, went to college. Soccer, and uh, well, he, he was a soccer, soccer champion right. there, All-American, and then he eventually ended up coaching at Clarkson. So there's a student community there. Mm. Um, and so the town really has a lot of um, contradictions within it because there's right. a progressive liberal student community and then there's also a more rural conservative town community. Um, so that 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 that's an interest it's an interesting place yeah definitely yeah. and then obviously race comes into the picture too with Nick Hillary and yes. how he factors in with everything so what is most interesting about how he factors into the story in terms of the police coming for him right away in terms of what happens years later for him yeah um, so Nick Hillary is a Jamaican American African American man um, military veteran mm -hmm. all-american soccer player very successful uh, collegiate soccer career um, who was coaching on the faculty at Clark Clarkson University he dated the mother of Garrett who lost his life um, so you know it's reasonable that you know you have a dead little boy you're gonna want to question the mother's ex-boyfriends that that makes sense um, so he you know he but you know the other the mother had other ex-boyfriends right. who um, one of whom was a sheriff's deputy mm. um, and so and hit the way that you know he was treated by the criminal justice system was quite different than the way Nick was treated and it's really interesting how narratives are shaped because suddenly the story comes out, well, Nick and Garrett didn't really have a great relationship. Right. And then the police, you know, some hours later are going to him. So what do you think was most surprising about how the police handled that whole situation? Right. So the police, the night of the murder, one of the um, police officers went to the family and started talking to them. And, and their feeling was Nick and Nick and Garrett had butted heads. Um, 
Tandy was struggling with Garrett in school, um, his performance in school, and she actually was calling on Nick to kind of help her discipline Garrett. Right, kind of coach and him get up him, yeah, yeah, like get him to do his math and work on time, you know, to just kind of like be a, you know, be a disciplinary figure in his life. Um, of course, a 12-year-old boy doesn't love that, right. especially with a mom's boyfriend. It's yeah. not even your dad, right? You don't like it when your dad does it either. So that clash was there. Um, you know, that... Um, a clash about discipline to murder yeah. <laughs> is a, a pretty big extreme. jump. Yeah. Um, but the thing about it is a little boy loses his life on, a, on an afternoon, on a Monday afternoon, nothing makes sense. Mm. So you've got to explore all crazy possibilities. Um, but there were rumors that he had been horsing around with other kids. That was kind of something in the air right after the crime happened. Um, but it really wasn't investigated. Um, so we have to ask the questions of, you know, there was this tunnel vision and that, that car started driving, and in that tunnel, there were no left or right exits. It just went straight down, and uh, that tunnel led towards Nick. And you just wonder what if, too, if that tunnel doesn't lead to Nick, and you start looking into some of the other different angles, how different does this case look? I'm sure that's something that you thought about, too. Well, yeah, and then also, you know, with so much time elapsing, if you're not looking at them, can you really mount a case? You right. know, of course, there are cold cases, and this is now. It's not a cold case, but this is an old, unsolved case at this point. Um, but how, what, what kind of opportunities have been missed for good investigative, investigative leads at this point in time? Definitely, and even for the family, like it, it's pretty clear early on that they think it's Nick, regardless of of anything, you know. And it doesn't seem like anything's going to change their minds with it. So, what was it like interacting with the family members? Well, I mean, it was it was listening to them. I mean, you know, in in their minds, there would there would Garrett had never had a bad word about anybody right. except Nick. So, mm. in their minds, this was the only thing that made sense. But I guess I just kind of go back to. You know, nothing makes sense when a little boy is murdered. Right. So, um, while you might try to hook on to a narrative, um, it just it just doesn't make sense because it's a horrible tragedy, and there's no real reason for it that anybody could imagine. If you had had time with Tandy Cyrus, what would you have talked to her about? You know, I did get to spend time with Tandy Cyrus off camera. Okay. Tandy's the mother of Garrett, um, and Terry Tandy was also you know was always a very kind and lovely human being. Um, if she had been, if she had sat for an interview, and she did sit for interviews with, um, I think it was Dateline or 2020, mm. but um, she, she see, you know, in her mind also, the only person she could think who could ever have a reason to hurt Garrett was Nick. Um, but she also knew Nick very well. Right. And as you can see in our documentary, I don't know if it's in the first half hour that you watch, but their relationship, it was, it, was, it was a very deep, profound relationship. They traveled together, they moved in together, they raised their kids together, they helped each other with their kids. So um, I have to imagine in her mind there, there were maybe some doubts that this person that she loved and trusted so much would be capable of such a thing. But I'm just guessing, I, you mm. know, because she didn't, um, she never expressed any doubts. I gotcha. So I think a lot of people will look at this and they'll think about the criminal justice system, they'll think about the flaws of the criminal justice system. When you take a step back and think about what you put together, what does, does this say about the system that we currently have today? I think when you look at this, I mean, you look at a town completely emotionally devastated by a murder of somebody they know um, and they're, the pressure to lock someone up immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the DA who was, elect, who was in, in, in that office at the time of the crime resisted for years the, that pressure to indict. Mm. Then another DA ran, Mary Rain, and she ran on the fact that somebody needed to pay for this crime. Right. And everybody knew exactly what that meant. Everybody knew she was talking about Nick Hillary. So politics in the legal, in the criminal justice system is a problem. Mm. <laughs> you know, running on the emotions of a grieving yeah. mother to get your office is a problem. Um, and that's how prosecutors get their jobs. Um, they, they get their jobs by running campaigns, and campaigns are emotional. So I think when we look at how about prosecutors and their power, um, and I think, you know, we have to, you know, we go to the voting box and we vote mm. for, for president, we're very motivated, but we also really have to pay attention to who we're putting in the district attorney's office. No question. Um, and it's a much less talked about race. I mean, now I think people are paying a little more attention, but it's, um, you know, and, and ultimately Mary Rain was, um, was suspended from practicing law because of severe misconduct. Um, and, uh, but I think if this case hadn't gotten national attention, she'd still be there. So I think, uh, I think that's one of the big lessons is to look at prosecutors and that there should be a body with prosecutorial oversight. Mm. Um, I, Governor Cuomo has talked about that um, now, and New York could be the first state which would 
um, establish such a thing. Uh, but I, I do think that that's something we should be talking about. It seems like there's a lot of important lessons here. Even having eight years to kind of digest everything that happened, and it just seems like a really popular thing, like the serial podcasts, like the Ted Bundy tapes. Like our culture is very fascinated with going back and looking at things. So yeah. why do you think that is such a fascination? Yeah, I mean, people talk right now about the true crime tr craze, mm -hmm. but I think it's been something that kind of always been a thing. Always been yeah. like journalists and filmmakers mm -hmm. and novelists, you know, have always been, you know, really interested in this corner of human psychology. You know, from In Cold Blood by Truman Capote yeah. to what well, you mentioned, Cyril, which is a more recent thing. But there have been documentaries, you know, you know, Paradise Lost or The Staircase, which have been covering these kinds of cases forever. Um, and I think it's because of a couple of things. I think it's it's the scariest thing that could ever happen to yeah. you as a family, you know, to lose a loved one to murder. So I think it appeal appeal appeals to that place in all of us that's that fear, like what if? And trying to understand it and trying to solve it as a way of trying to control something that feels so out of control. Um, and I think that, I also think for women who I know are big mm, consumers right. of true crime, there is that feeling of vulnerability in our society. And I think that, that again, it's about kind of wanting to understand it and control it and make sense of it um, in a world that feels very scary. Um, so I think it appeals to those places, but and I would also say that you know, the desire for justice That's is a um, yeah. is a good thing. Yeah. You know, sometimes people say, "Oh, are we salacious? Like we like to watch about these crimes?" But actually, the desire that justice is done is a positive impulse. Right. And so you know, I'd like to look at it that way. And it's the whole no stone unturned thing too. It's just we'd like to know if somebody did this and for that person to pay the price. And we'd yeah. also like to hold power accountable. Yeah, that's you know? true. And um, so yeah, we want to turn over the stones and we want to hold power accountable and, and you know put daylight into something that could be shrouded in secrecy. Right, it doesn't matter if it's national or local politics, is that we have to speak truth to this and that's a really important function of our society as well. Yeah, and all of us are supposed to sit on juries, right? right. And so like I think as a jury member, like watching these shows and thinking about what happens behind the scenes, it, it's that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Definitely. Yeah. So why was HBO the right spot and how did you go about breaking this up into two parts instead of just one big thing? I've worked with HBO um, for a really long time and I love working with them. They um, give filmmakers their freedom. Mm. They are not afraid. They never pull their punches. Like when you have to go over legal, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's aired in these documentaries about different people and their performance and their jobs. And they're always, they have your back journalistically, which is amazing. Um, and, you know, there was so much story here. And this, you know, when you see all of it, which mm -hmm. I hope you will, I'm and I hope your viewers oh, will, no, you'll see that there's just a left turn and a right turn. Like, like you cannot believe the different mm -hmm. things that come up. Like our mouths were, like jaws were dropping, you know, all the time. It was already a crazy case to begin yeah, with. Then but then, and then, and then through, through the criminal trial, what happens, which is in part two, um, there's just so much story there. So at first we thought it was gonna be a documentary, but then there was just so much story there that HBO said, yeah, expand it, tell the story in the fullest way it needs to be because a lot of shows have been done on the, I mean mm -hmm. a lot of news has been right, people have covered in the past. covered it but you know this we needed time to really get it out there and I think that's that's what we've done what made your jaw drop the most with this whole story wow. there were so many moments I mean whether it was um, you know there's there's a moment in the trial where you realize that the prosecution was withholding evidence mm. um, there are things that people said just in my interviews with them where I was like, wait, are you really saying that on camera? Um, but what I find is that um, they felt very righteous about their decisions. So yes, they were saying it because that was their permission and for position, and I respect that. You've tackled a lot of really interesting topics in your career, whether it's the Fourth Estate, whether it's Marilyn Monroe. I mean, you've just kind of gone in on everything. How do you go back about picking your topics for your docs? Hmm. I don't know. It's like I guess it's like love at first sight. Yeah. It's just like a feeling you have, and uh, you know. Obviously, I'm drawn to stories about social justice. Obviously, I'm drawn to stories about interesting women. You know, from Nina Simone sure. or uh, Marilyn Monroe. But I, um, it's just about yeah. It's like it's like falling in love. You know, I don't know, but you know it when you see it. And like also just unpacking stories too, because like Marilyn Monroe is somebody that you can easily put in a box, but there's so much more to her story. That's right. And to understand it, it must be interesting to kind of pull those strings a little bit. Yeah, you. it is about like, bringing out an aspect that maybe you hadn't thought about or, you know, and then all of a sudden you realize like you have connections with this person, mm. the viewer, you know, that you, that seems so distant right. and other than you, you know? And um, yeah, I guess for me, that's the pleasure of it is, um, 
you know, bring you you you, th you might think you know this story, but I'm going to bring you something that you didn't know Definitely. about it. Yeah. And I'm sure you want to make people feel things as well. And and with this story, there's there's so much to feel. So what are the main things you want people to feel when they check? This what out? I want them to feel. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> because there's a, um, there's a ton of different well, options. Well, I think that you know, I think that some outrage might yeah, happen. Sure. I think some empathy. I think sadness for this mm -hmm. family um, who was not delivered justice, despite you know an extremely long and exhausting criminal justice process. Um, and I think that when you watch the small, you know, there's one one bit of archive that we brought into the film of the first time where Nick is interrogated by the police. And I think when you watch it and you see the small ways in which this policing is done. You know, reminds you of the Central Park Five. Mm. It just reminds you of the ways in which African Americans have been targeted in law enforcement by law enforcement, and the subtle ways, and sometimes not so subtle ways, in which they try to get convictions. Um, and you know, it could be you, it could be anybody. Sure. And I think, um, you know, that's that's one of the. I think there's some outrage there. Yeah, a lot yeah. of different angles to this. Yeah. I'm definitely going to check out the rest. It's really <laughs> Thank nice to meet you. you. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Why don't you tell everybody where they could check it out? Oh, Tuesday, HBO? Tuesday and Wednesday nights on HBO. I hope you'll watch. There you go. That's Liz. I'm DJ. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.